think we want to restrict the discussion to that level. If you would like to say that by definition, any device that can perform these operations is intelligent, then computers can be intelligent. But what we're really interested in is whether or not a computer can have intelligence as we understand it in human beings. So there are a number of observations to make here. First of all, a computer has to have a program. Now, once a computer is programmed, it can execute that program. But the program thus far is produced by a human being and entered into the computer in a particular form. Now, as far as anyone knows, the human brain does not have a program. That is as far as current scientific knowledge is concerned. Actually, I would like to make the suggestion that the human brain does have a program. I would like to suggest that we don't really wish to object to this parallel which is being drawn between the computer and the human brain. Rather, what we would like to do is say that this parallel should be drawn out further and made more comprehensive. The brain is indeed like a computer, and just as a computer requires a programmer, the brain also requires a programmer. But what is the programmer of the brain? So, before getting to that point, let me say a few things about the different examples of intelligence which are given here. In every case, you'll see that the computer is solving a particular problem. Now, before the computer solved that problem, some human being worked out the solution in an abstract form within his own mind. Now, you might say in a certain case, the computer even learns by itself. The computer even comes up with its own heuristics. But, in such cases, the programmer in advance figured out an algorithm whereby the computer could come up with its own heuristics. You see, you can solve problems at various levels of generality, and mathematicians do this. Just to give you an example, suppose I presented you with a computer which could solve problems in geometry. You might even ask it to prove that the sum of the squares of the sides of a right triangle equals the square of the hypotenuse. And sure enough, after processing that request for a while, it would come out with a rigorous mathematical proof starting from the axioms of geometry. So you might say, well, this computer is exhibiting intelligence if it does that. Now, I think you could do that. In fact, I even think I could do that, as a matter of fact. But what would be involved in doing it? What you find is that the human programmer figures out what logical procedures are required to solve a given class of mathematical problems, such as the class of problems in classical Euclidean geometry. That would be a very difficult area in which to do it. But theorem-proving programs have been written for more restricted classes of mathematical problems. So the point is, in advance, the human programmer, in his own mind, understood how any such problem could be systematically broken down and solved by a step-by-step procedure involving these logical functions here, these Boolean operations. So the computer can do that after that program has been entered into it. The real work there, I would submit, has been done by the human mathematician who worked out the systematic scheme, and the computer merely puts it into execution. Now, if you would like to define that as intelligence, that's okay. In that case, the computer has intelligence, and there's no objection to saying that. But what about the function of creating that algorithm, of arriving at the algorithm? Can a computer do that? Well, as a matter of fact, you could even conceive of a computer that can invent algorithms. But how will the computer invent algorithms? It will only do so if some human being invents a meta-algorithm which 
can be used by these systematic logical steps to generate algorithms, which you can even conceivably do. Practically, there's no limit that we know of to what you can do in mathematics, apart from certain limitations provided, say, by Gundel's work and things like that. So it is conceivable that a human being who had very great insight into mathematics could devise a general logical scheme that could solve a whole class of mathematical problems that people in general find it very difficult to solve. And if he could do that, then it follows inevitably from that that a computer could be programmed to execute that algorithm. And in that case, the computer could solve all those problems. So the interesting thing is that human beings can somehow or other come up with these ideas. Uh, computers can only execute them once human beings have come up with them. So the question is, uh, how does one come up with these ideas? Now one could even propose in principle that we may come up with an ultimate algorithm which would account for all human creativity. In other words, if you were to put this algorithm in a computer, the computer would act creatively as a human being uh, fully. Uh, so one can consider whether or not that is possible. At the present time, such ideas are exceedingly utopian. Uh, we have no real basis in terms of experience we have with computers thus far for saying we can actually do something like that. Computers can solve certain classes of problems that mathematicians understand in advance very well. But uh, the idea of a computer that could exhibit general creativity, well, no one has thus far exhibited the creativity needed to come up with such an algorithm. So whether that is possible or not is a matter of sheer conjecture. And it's not, therefore, really relevant to a discussion of artificial intelligence. Srila Prabhupada, of course, gave many times the post-dated blank check uh, argument, namely that uh, it is not valid to say, well, in the future we will do a particular thing. He was interested only in what uh, people can actually do at the present time. Now, this playing of chess, for example, uh, there are computers now that can beat even master chess players, but they cannot yet beat the, the best human chess players. But those computers operate according to strategies that people have worked out, and the computer can simply execute the strategy much faster than a human being can. Uh, so that's how uh, these things operate. Somebody has understood the chess strategy in advance and programmed the computer with that strategy. So that's one point to make uh, concerning computers and intelligence. Now, another very significant and practical point to make here is that all the things that computers can do well represent only one small facet of what human beings do in their normal social interactions. And that is an extremely, you might say, abstract, circumscribed, and artificial facet involving formal mathematics. But let's consider other things that people can do. Someone comes into a room and you recognize him and say, Hello, George. How are you doing? Uh, you may have seen him from the side, let's say. Uh, or you may catch just a glimpse of him and immediately you recognize who that is. Can a computer do that? Well, in principle, you might think that a computer could do it, but no one has ever succeeded in programming a computer to do that. It's an extremely difficult problem. Uh, at MIT, we were once just having a discussion with the people who worked on the Sherblu program, uh, which was invented by a fellow named Terry Winograd. This was one of the great triumphs of artificial intelligence. This was a program in which you had a sort of artificial world of blocks, like children's toy blocks of different kinds. And these were of different colors and they could be stacked on top of one another. So you could type into the computer a command in English saying, uh, pick up the green block that is sitting on the blue block uh, next to 
a stack of two red blocks and put it into a box. And then the computer would do that. Or else, if you couldn't figure it out, it would say, oh, this is ambiguous. There are, there are two green blocks in that position. Which one do you want me to, to pick? And so forth. So in this blocks world, the computer could answer questions and behave in response to those questions as though it understood what it was being asked. And so we were asking, well, how does the computer recognize these blocks and their relationships? Um, this involves a whole analysis of edges and corners and how they relate and so forth. Um, it's quite complex. So we asked, could you do this with curved surfaces? Um, and they said, we have no idea how to do it with curved surfaces. So that's one point about computers. Actually, at the present time, uh, people are thinking um, that the approach to artificial intelligence that has been pursued in places like MIT for the last 20 years or so is not going to be effective. And they're now looking into what are called neural nets as a method of simulating what the human brain can do. Uh, these computers are what are called sequential processes. They perform one step at a time very rapidly. Uh, it is beginning to appear that although, according to what is called Turing's thesis, a computer can perform any computation that is conceivable, nonetheless, in practice, in real time, it is not possible for a computer of this sequential nature to duplicate many functions of the brain. And what to speak of intelligence, it would not be possible to have a computer that in real time can even exhibit the visual performance of, say, a, a dog or even a bumblebee. Uh, the pattern recognition tasks are really not uh, practically attainable even using a Cray supercomputer or something like that if you want to perform those tasks in real time. So they're looking into neural nets and so forth. So um, this is an important point considering the limitations of what people have been able to do with computers. Uh, there's another whole line of thought here which is related to this. Uh, this has to do with uh, knowledge representation. Uh, how can you represent in a, within the memory of a computer the knowledge that a five-year-old child has about his mother's kitchen? You can pose this question. This has been very seriously considered by researchers in artificial intelligence. You see, in all the functions that are described here, the data that the machine manipulates is a fairly limited and circumscribed nature. For example, the position of the men on a chessboard is very easy to represent. You have 64 squares and so and so many different men. So it's a simple matter to represent that within the computer. But you may ask, how do you represent this knowledge that the child has of his mother's kitchen? Just consider how much knowledge there is. There's the knowledge of what an apple looks like so that you can tell that it's an apple from many different angles. If you see a slice of an apple, you can tell that that's a slice of an apple as opposed to a spoon. So they know what spoons are, knives, forks, what the stove is, what the soot on the pan is, so many different things. If you even pause and try to enumerate all that information and somehow order it in a logical way, you'll see it's a very formidable task just to define all that information. So in order for computers to handle that, First of all, as things stand today, people have to be able to define that information and represent it somehow with the machine. Of course, there's the idea of programming the machine so it will learn all that information by itself, just as a child does. But no one has been able to come up with a program like that. So, in supposedly complex things that seem to take a lot of intelligence, like, say, playing chess, the computer may be very good. But in going into a, a kitchen and noticing that a cookie is something different from a spoon or a kettle on the stove, etc., this is beyond the capacity of um, computers as far as present day progress is concerned. So these are a few points concerning computers, not at all touching on the whole topic of consciousness. So as far as the idea of Programmer being less than a human being because it, uh, it is programmed by some other intelligence. 
I would reply that a human being also is just uh, an animal, uh, an intelligent animal, unless he's programmed by years and years of learning. The human being actually is, <coughs> and his baby is completely ignorant, and uh, day by day, the mother first, then uh, the, the teachers, they are ancient knowledge, and that knowledge, by uh, we understand it, by a comparison and by uh, weighing pros and cons, is uh, is creating the whole intelligence of the child. So now we are expecting that uh, computing science, which is quite new science, can accomplish the same uh, with just a few programs, the same which is accomplished by years and years of programming of the human brain. Well, of course, your statements rely, rely heavily on the posted blank check approach. In other words, you're talking about um, we can't do it now because we don't understand how the brain works and we haven't been able to figure out how to program computers to do these things and the computers don't have sufficient capacity. That's why we haven't been able to do it yet. But in the future, we'll be able to do these things. Um, this is a basic point of logic, but this is not valid reasoning uh, in any situation. So one has to stick to the actual uh, facts. And the fact is that at present, computers have not been able to do all these utopian things that you're talking about. Now, concerning uh, programming, you started out um, with a fallacy by saying that human beings are being programmed throughout their childhood development through the educational process and so forth. Um, of course, this um, is the tabula rasa idea of the human being. But one has to distinguish between this and the programming of the computer. Because in the programming of the computer, the programmer is truly dealing with the top of the roster. He has a certain set of uh, instructions that he can work with that is supplied by the, the computer language that he's using. In terms of those instructions, he has to figure out within his own mind a logical set of steps which will cause the computer to do the desired task, whatever it may be. Then he writes this down, enters that into the computer, and executes it. And if he has worked out his ideas correctly, then the computer will perform in the desired way. We don't do that when we educate children. We don't do anything like that. We talk to them, we explain ideas to them, somehow they understand or in some cases they don't understand this. But whatever is going on in their minds is a complete mystery to us, actually. No one understands what's going on in the mind of a child or any other human being when you teach them something. And no one can really explain why one child understands it very quickly and another does not. And in any case, certainly no one is understanding how the neurons are hooked together and seeing that, well, if we systematically reconnect them in this way, then the brain will pr produce the following functions, and so forth. So, it is quite incorrect to suggest that uh, the word programming as applied to computers similarly applies to human beings. That would be uh, a misuse of uh, language. So, in actual fact, we see that human beings are very far from being a tabula rasa. <coughs> And many things that human beings come up with cannot be accounted for in terms of their education. Um, this includes computers themselves. Uh, I think it's fair to say that there's nothing in the education of John von Neumann which would account for the fact that he created the idea of the general purpose uh, digital computer. Uh, or in the life of Alan Turing, who did the same thing in England about the same time. Uh, obviously, there were many other people who had a similar education to these men, and they didn't invent computers, or perhaps didn't invent anything in their entire lives. So how do you account for this inventive uh, process? That is something that uh, one should at least consider with an open mind. Now, as for what computer algorithms are able to do, in fact, we don't yet see computers that exhibit this kind of inventiveness. And even if, as you say, a computer discovers a law, you can be sure that the programmer 
understood that that algorithm was such as would lead to the revelation of that law. Sure. You think the programmers are so stupid? No. They can understand um, the sort of thing that the computer can come up with. And, of course, you see you can get into a, a fine point here. If you program a computer to compute 100 digits of pi, it may do that, and you may not know those 100 digits of pi. So you don't know what is coming out, but you understand the general principles by which it's producing the result. And in the case of computers that perform various operations and so forth, the human programmer understands the principles by which the computer is producing a given result. It's actually a significant question of how the human brain gets programmed. That is where the programming in the computer sense really comes from. Um, of course, people indeed do not understand the, the human brain. As far as the capacity of computers is concerned, as I was saying, the indication is we'll need parallel processes to duplicate um, human sensory functions. It is probable that most of the functions of visual perception can be uh, reproduced using suitable parallel processes. Uh, basically, you have to have something on the same level of organization as the brain, which has an estimated, well, there are different estimates, but about 100 billion neurons uh, interconnected in a very complex pattern. I myself would think that if you can make a computer with the equivalent of 100 billion neurons interconnected together in the right way, you can duplicate all kinds of different human functions, but still there's a question of where the organization or the actual programming comes from. Uh, I'd like to make another point about what young children do. It's a rather amazing thing to see. Uh, they learn to speak, and uh, it's quite remarkable because uh, they somehow figure out grammar when they're about, you know, two or three years old. And they can't even explain to you how they do it, but somehow they do it. In a, a few years, they're speaking fluently a particular language that they've been exposed to. Uh, linguists who carefully make uh, an academic or scientific study of language, you know, go into all kinds of intricate lines of abstract reasoning trying to understand grammar. But here this child, just picks it up. Uh, it would be very interesting to program a computer that could learn to speak. Um, I personally think that in principle you might even do that. But I'd like to see you do it without understanding the basic principles of how a child learns to speak. Uh, stats in the dark generally don't work in the area of computer programming. There's a uh, standard saying of ego. Can you that one? So, garbage in, garbage out. Which describes what happens with computers. Uh, generally speaking, if you don't know what you're doing, you're not going to get a good result. In fact, universally that's the case. Even if you think you know what you're doing, you probably have to spend a lot of time trying to debug the program to iron out flaws in your own reasoning, which you didn't think were there. Actually, the computer is very merciless in revealing the flaws in the reasoning of the programmer. And most of the time spent in computer programming, including producing all these artificial intelligence, intelligence programs that produce these various amazing results, most of that work is spent in ironing out flaws in the algorithm. The person writes his algorithm, has the computer executed, and the thing fails to work properly. So then he thinks, how does that happen? And uh, eventually he figures out why it wasn't working properly. And then he fixes his algorithm. Then he runs it again, and something else goes wrong. Uh, you can spend hours and hours and hours of labor doing this. And this is what hackers, as they're called, really do. So the end product, it's not just some marvel of intelligence that manifests in the machine. I think you could argue that it's the intelligence of the human programmer that has finally been crystallized in a sufficiently precise form so now that it can, it can be uh, 
automatically executed by the computer. But we don't yet have computers that can do this programming work for us. And it's a bit utopian to say that, well, uh, once we come to the development of nanotechnology and we can uh, produce switching systems on the level of protein molecules and so forth, uh, then computers will acquire these capacities. That again is the um, post-dated blank check idea. So this is still on the negative side. I think it's not completely honest, the comparison between the child and the computer. Uh, first of all, we know that evolution has started with one cell organisms. So you speak where is the original program coming from, but it has been developing over the period of so many millions of years. And we say that the power of our computers will be like 10, 20 years be enough to store the necessary information and the speed will be high enough to access the information quick enough. Then you say it's post-dated, we only speak in terms of 20 years, but a child has been developing from the cell, so all these billions of years has been there to make that program which is in the child in the beginning, the, the basic program, which is which you could call an auto-learning program. Could you say something about that? It's actually a very logical development. We now come to the theory of evolution. And <laughs> really, it is. It's very logical. And that, by the way, is why the theory of evolution is a very important topic for us to, to discuss. Um, so, as far as the idea that the human mental capacities have uh, developed as a result of the process of evolution taking place over millions of years, this proposal is not a real contribution to scientific knowledge, but it is simply a red herring, that's um, English phrase anyway, that diverts one's attention from the real problems. Because we have no, even if it is true, that man has evolved over millions and millions of years from an original single cell organism, even if that's actually true, we have no idea how that has come about, nor do we have any means to really establish that it's true. But uh, let us argue, just for the sake of argument, that it is true that if you go back to the Precambrian period, you'll find just single cell organisms in the oceans of the Earth. And then you go through a series of stages to metazoan creatures, uh, the first fish, amphibians, reptiles, mammals, uh, monkey-like creatures, apes, finally human beings. In the course of that development, how is it that this programming of the brain, which allows for intelligence, has come to be? No one has any idea. You would have to say that if you have a brain that is working at a certain level of organization, and you randomly mutate the DNA that defines the organization of that brain, uh, sometimes the mutation will produce a defect um, and the resulting organism will tend to die out in the process of natural competition. Other times it may produce an improvement. Uh, and in that case, by definition, the organism will reproduce more effectively. As a result of this process, one has to say that human intelligence has arisen. Uh, no one has any idea how human intelligence could arise by such a process. It's simply a hand-waving argument. We don't know the first thing about it. Even if, that's, even if it's really true that it happened that way, we don't know anything about it. So therefore, to say, well, the computers are evolving uh, very rapidly, and human beings have had so much longer to evolve, therefore it's reasonable that they should be better than the computers, that the computers will quickly catch up. This is not a valid argument. Actually, the kind of argument you should pursue if you're really interested in how these things work is to examine actual models and examine how computer programs actually work and focus on the real question of how you would make a computer program that would exhibit uh, human creativity so many different features. Now, people in artificial intelligence have been working on it for many years. Over 20 years ago, Marvin Minsky of 
MIT was saying that in 20 years you'll have computers that exceed the human level of intelligence. So it's interesting that this number 20 comes up. I don't know why. But over 20 years ago, Minsky was saying in 20 years the computers will exceed human intelligence. And his idea that they will indeed be auto-learning computers which will then bootstrap themselves even further and become superhuman. And Minsky said maybe they will keep us as pets. That was his proposal. So perhaps fortunately this didn't come to pass. And there's actually a fair amount of frustration in the artificial intelligence community. And in fact the whole trend in science, as I was mentioning today, is to go into the neural net approach now and abandon the sequential computer method of trying to create intelligence. So statements about what is going to be done in 20 years don't help one in scientific understanding. That's the real problem with this post-dated blank check argument, which is the only argument they really have, saying in 20 years we will do this. Actually, wasn't it the Frenchman? I don't speak French, but La Métrier, he wrote a book called The Home Machine. How would you pronounce that in French? The Home Machine. The Home Machine. So this was in the 18th century that he wrote this book. I think it was the 18th century. He outlined all the arguments for why a human being is simply a mechanism way back then. And here we are in the 20th century. And the same argument is being made. So what I'd like to do now is make a constructive proposal. And this is to suggest that the human brain actually is programmed by a non-physical entity which interacts with the brain. This is a suggestion for further scientific research. Is that what you call the ghost in the machine? This is the ghost in the machine. We are proposing to use the sarcastic phrase of Gilbert Ryle, the Cambridge professor. Yes, I'm proposing that there is a ghost in the machine. I'm resurrecting Cartesian dualism. We can bring up René Descartes. So I would suggest this would actually be a fruitful line of investigation. You see, one question you can ask is, in the execution of algorithms, how far do you go from the point of information input to the computer? You see, you can program a computer to do a particular thing. But we find in practice that after a while, we're not satisfied with what it's doing. We want it to do more things. So then we put in more programming, and then it does more things. So in the execution of different human functions, you can ask, how long is the sequence of steps involved going from a point where information has to be introduced, reintroduced, in order to keep the human entity going? There happens to be medical evidence that has some bearing on this. And this comes from the study of epilepsy. There's a certain kind of epilepsy, petite mal epilepsy, called automatism, which is well studied in the medical profession. This involves a chaotic discharge of nerve impulses in a particular part of the brain, which is usually set off by some injury, which is there in the brain. It's a sort of avalanche effect. Just like rolling a snowball down a mountain slope with a lot of snow, it builds up more and more until you have a huge avalanche. Well, this occurs in the brain and can cause epilepsy. In some cases, the result is the avalanche affects the motor regions of the brain, and this causes violent muscular contractions, and the person goes into convulsions. But there are other cases where the epileptic discharge affects a certain region in the midbrain, and the person becomes what is called an automaton. It's very interesting to see how the person behaves. A person who goes into this state of automatism may, let us say, at that time be walking home from work. Well, he walks all the way home. He stops for traffic. 
He responds appropriately to lights and signs. He exhibits ability to read, and so forth. But if you go up and try and engage in conversation with him, it's like talking to a zombie. It's been known to happen that a person may have uh, an epileptic attack of this kind, say, while playing the piano. The person keeps right on playing, but something goes out of the playing of that person. Uh, the music becomes mechanical. Uh, there was one case of a child who was practicing piano lessons, who had this epileptic problem. And the mother would sometimes notice that her playing changed in a subtle way. All the sort of meaning and feeling went out of it, uh, even though she was still playing properly. Uh, and she could tell, well, now she's having one of her attacks. So uh, one could suggest, in fact, this was suggested by a neuroscientist named Wilder Penfield, that what we see here is a distinction between what the brain really can do as a computer or an automaton and what the brain can do when it's getting input from some other source, which I would propose to be the non-physical mind. Uh, this is a hypothesis, but at least it's something that you can think about and it can lead to further fruitful research. So the suggestion here is that in fact the brain automaton can do quite remarkable things. It can even cause the body to walk home through traffic, uh, crossing different streets and so forth appropriately. But it lacks something. Uh, it doesn't able to interact with us in what we would call a really human fashion. So one could propose the following model, that the brain really is like a computer that performs marvelous information processing tasks but it's a special purpose computer that the mind is using in order to guide and program the body. And there's even a, uh, a conclusion from this useful for devotees. Namely, that the brain automaton can chant your rounds for you. <laughs> it's really a serious proposal. That your mind is somewhere else. Your mind is somewhere else. <laughs> that can happen. Because, in fact, when we're, at, when we're inattentive to our rounds, we're thinking of something else, and the voice is going around chanting Hare Krishna, all the syllables are there, and so on. That's the uh, brain automaton. And the brain automaton doesn't make any spiritual advancement because it's a material system. Meanwhile, the soul is focusing on a different subject matter, quite far removed from Krishna. <laughs> So that's just a practical suggestion based on this idea. Yeah? Is there evidence to uh, prove that or demonstrate that, that the mind uh, continues unchanged, even in cases where there's gross damage or permanent or temporary damage to the brain? Well, the whole study of brain damage is very interesting. And this, of course, has bearing on the topic we deliberately avoided thus far in the consciousness. For example, a complete hemispherectomy, that is a removal, a surgical removal of one cerebral hemisphere, can be carried out under local anesthesia, uh, and the patient is conscious during the entire operation. This is actually done. Horrendous to what you've seen. So you can remove half of the person's cerebrum and his consciousness isn't affected when you do it. Of course, when the person recovers from the operation, he's what's called hemiplegic. One half of his body won't function. And it may be that uh, he's what's called aphasic. He loses the power of speech. Uh, but if he does retain any capacity to communicate through speech at all, Sometimes this, is, um, this capacity is there, but it's greatly impaired. He will announce that he was conscious during the whole thing, and he's still conscious now. But now he's feeling very frustrated because when he tries to speak, it won't work. Uh, there, are, just to give you an example of what some people go through in this regard, there was a Russian soldier who was severely wounded in World War II and recovered. Uh, he lost the power of speech but he was still able to read and comprehend. 
Um, so he wasn't able to write, however. If he wanted to write, it just wouldn't happen. So what people would do is they would flash words before him, cut out from newspapers, just one word after another. When they came to the next word that he was thinking of, that he wanted, but which he couldn't think of, and he couldn't speak, he couldn't even point to the letters and spell it out because he couldn't think of the word. But as soon as the word he wanted came before his eyes, he'd recognize it. Just as sometimes you may have the experience that uh, you're trying to think of something, and as soon as you see something that reminds you of it, ah, you think of it. So in this way, by indicating, well, that's the, the word, and then he'd indicate the next word, and so on, he actually wrote essays and explained his situation in life and how frustrating it was. Uh, so this is an example. Uh, one could suggest here that the brain computer in this case was severely impaired uh, due to the damage, but somehow the link up with the mind uh, was intact. And the computer wasn't so severely impaired that it wasn't possible for the mind still to make use of it. At least one can suggest this might be a fruitful line of inquiry. I'm not saying that anything I've said here proves that. But I do suggest that rather than saying, uh, you know, in 20 years or whatever, computers are going to do all these marvelous things, when in fact we have no idea how to do it, uh, it's worthwhile considering some alternative hypotheses especially considering the fact that people have thought very carefully about how to make a computer that can learn in a flexible way like a child. And people haven't come up with the right insights yet. Even if it's possible to do that, we don't have the insight yet as to how to program a computer to do it. It's easy to get a computer to store data. Uh, if you've got a computer that stores up lots of data, it can easily know many more shlokas than you do. Right? Sure. But how to get the computer to exhibit human intelligence and human knowledge? We haven't thought of how to do it yet. So at the present stage of our knowledge, it's worthwhile considering some alternative hypotheses. Scientists should be more open to the total range of data that's actually there and available for them. Um, so that's something I can suggest without even bringing in other data, which scientists tend to neglect, such as the out-of-body experience data, which is a very interesting thing. I suppose I may as well mention it, because if we're speaking of data, uh, we may as well consider what is there. Um, I'll give you what seems to me to be a quite scientifically respectable example of this. There's a doctor, uh, William Satan, who's a cardiologist. His practice has mainly been in Florida, and he was attached to the Emory University Medical School at one time. So he was told by a colleague of his about a book by one Raymond Mooney, uh, I think called Life After Life, which recounted incidents in which a person had a heart attack and was resuscitated by the doctors, and then reported that he had traveled outside of his body and experienced different things. So a book of case histories of this sort was published. So when Saban heard about this, he was extremely skeptical. And he thought that these stories probably represent hallucinatory dreams that the person had either just before or just after the attack, related to the anxiety of having a close brush with death. You know, one might say that because one realizes one is actually dying, one begins to imagine how one is separate from the body or something like that. So he thought, there's some explanation like this that will account for these things. So, under pressure from his colleague, he began to interview his own patients. So he had many uh, case studies from his own practice uh, in which he knew the exact medical procedures that were carried out while the person was unconscious. Uh, and not only unconscious, but with a heart that was not beating, so no blood was circulating to the, the brain. So he would interview the patients who reported out-of-body experiences and ask them to explain what was going on during their resuscitation. Um, he found, to his amazement, that a significant number of patients were able to give very detailed descriptions of exactly what was going on. 
and the procedures are not identical in every case. There are many different things that doctors can do. They do them in different orders and so forth, depending on the particular case. So they were able to give accurate accounts of what happened when their heart was actually stopped and had been stopped for at least a couple of minutes because it takes time for the nurses to see the person is having an attack for the doctors to rush them into the intensive care unit and start applying the different machines that they use to resuscitate the person and so forth. Uh, he found that none of the patients he interviewed made any serious mistake concerning what had happened. Some of them were quite vague, but none made a serious mistake and many gave considerable detail. As a test, he interviewed a whole series of patients who had not had out-of-body experiences. He called these seasoned cardiac patients who had spent a lot of time in hospitals and had had a reasonable opportunity to acquaint themselves with the, the medical literature, who had also, since they had a serious heart condition, naturally they were interested in those things. So um, they had every opportunity to acquaint themselves with what happens in cardiac resuscitation. He found they tended to make serious mistakes about the procedures in their accounts, and also many accounts were vague. So he came to the conclusion that it would appear that um, some kind of mind activity is going on, which involves sense perception and storage of memory. Uh, and this can occur when the brain is not functioning. And he considered many alternative explanations. There's a whole list of them. Uh, temporal lobe epilepsy, hypercarbia, hyperoxia. Uh, there's a whole list of explanations that you could use to try to account for this. And in his book, he pretty systematically went through all of them. So he became convinced that it appears that there's some non-physical thing that can um, it has senses and memory and intelligence. So that's interesting evidence that has bearing on this whole, whole issue. So one can suggest that artificial intelligence people, um, to them that it's all well and good to think of the brain as a very remarkable computer-like information processing device, but maybe there's also a program with that brain. Maybe it's more like the automatic pilot of an airplane which carries out functions in the airplane, including even navigation, uh, so as an aid to the pilot, uh, and analogies like that. Yeah? If the computer can purpose enough, and uh, everything was there to, to make sense, and I think it could um, such a non-physical being be exactly the structure of the computer and actually start to act. <laughs> well, one wonders if that may be the fate of Marvin Minsky. <laughs> I don't know. You see, for that to happen, the subtle mind would have to interact with the electronics of the computer somehow. Now, there's the question then, uh, well, if there really is a subtle mind that is uh, programming the brain computer mechanism, then how does that work? How does it actually interact with the operations of the neurons and so forth. Well, that was, of course, one of the things that I was discussing um, the day before yesterday, that these different uh, considerations regarding the laws of physics do suggest a way in which a non-physical mind, something by non-physical here, I would mean, by definition, more subtle than the ethereal element, just to nail down the term, precise definition. Uh, how a non-physical mind could interact with the, the nervous system and uh, program the brain. So this also, by the way, is something that scientists could research. For example, this uh, professor I met from uh, Shanghai in China was thinking along these lines himself. He was thinking that these manifestations of deterministic chaos in his models of the glial cells suggested to him how the mind might interact with the, um, the brain. So that's something that conceivably could even be investigated, although admittedly it would be very hard to investigate it. But um, it's a line of fruitful scientific research. One can even think of experiments there uh, that one could pursue. Yeah? Um, as far as the 
words that have been used in telegrams to say in Biblia is a question of definition. We have some definition about the activities of intelligence and the activities of the mind. The mind is supposed to be the source of feeling, thinking and learning, and the intelligence is supposed to be speaking between what is supposed to be good and bad. And then, if we go to spiritual intelligence, it's supposed to be between what's spiritual and what's material. So when we speak about artificial intelligence, <coughs> we've been speaking tonight about not from the world of the world, calculation, sorting, deduction, um, would rather pertain to the thinking thing. The storage of data would be also in the mind, and the function of intelligence itself would be the discriminating, discriminating factor in what is good and bad for the system in a, in a certain condition. So, um, this intelligence as such, uh, putting it aside of any consideration of thinking of data, of memory, which is as such not needed. In other words, whatever set of mind, mentality, personality, the principle of intelligence and discrimination between two situations doesn't depend on the set of experience from the, from the entity, but on the uh, prevalence of desires to analyze what is right and wrong. Well, you're defining intelligence as discrimination. Um, so we can think about that for a moment. We have to keep in mind this post-dated blank check argument that always crops up. Uh, you can certainly program a computer to discriminate between different situations. For example, uh, you can make a computer program very easily to discriminate between a circle and a square. Just to give a simple example. It's practically trivial to do that. So you can say, well, that program exhibits discrimination. Uh, then you could even program a computer to control a robot in such a way that it would make discriminations within the context of its environment so as to avoid some kind of danger. machine. 